I think we're going to go ahead and get started. There might be some stragglers, but um, we want to go ahead and start today. Um, our speaker, Joe Janes, is an associate professor and associate dean for academics at the University of Washington. He was the founding director of the Internet Public Library, which is a um, innovative online reference service. And he also has written eight books on the subject of librarianship, technology, and their relationship to each other. He writes a column, Internet Librarian for American Libraries Association. And he has taught at the University of Michigan, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the State University of New York at Albany, as well as at Syracuse University and the University of Washington, where he now is. He just recently received the 2006 Isadora Gilbert Midge Award from the American Library Association for distinguished contributions to reference librarianship. And we are very honored to have him here today. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, we've been trying for <clears throat> months to figure out a good time for me to come down to Eugene and, and get a chance to meet you all and speak, and I'm glad we figured out a good time. Um, it gets me out of town, and, and <clears throat> that's a good thing. And as I was saying to Tracy, I'm not answering my email today, although I'm going to want an Ethernet tap at some point just to make myself feel better. Um, and um, uh, uh, I just... You know, this, this is my chance to get out and see the world and, and uh, talk to people and meet people and so on. So I'm delighted to be here and very happy and looking forward to, to spending time with you all. Um, before I get started or to get myself started, I, wanna, I always start with what I consider a semi-shameless plug, which is to send us your best people. Um, we in the education business for library and information have known for that the best that we have are people who are in the profession. Our students are who you think would be um, of interest to, uh, proceed, to uh, proceed to the professional degree and to, to join the professional ranks. Uh, we would be delighted. We very much think of ourselves, we at the University of Washington, we very much think of ourselves as the, the school um, for Oregon. We think of ourselves as your school. Um, and we have, Tracy tells me, six students in our distance program here in Eugene at the moment. And I know we've got people through the rest of the state. And we couldn't be happier. Um, the response to the distance program has been extraordinary throughout the region, uh, all the way up to Alaska and all the way down through into California and everywhere in between, and even a few people east of the Rockies. Um, that, that's been just a terrific experience, and, um, uh, and I'm just now finishing my first distance class, which Tracy was in, um, on, what, on what is Google, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. So, uh, so send us your best people, uh, the people who you think are the next generation of the profession, the people who you think can take on the challenges that we all know we're going to face over the next decades, um, send them to us. Um, you know, there are other great programs all over the country. Those are fine. The absolute, you know, the, the Tracys of the world, the, you know, the ones who just float right to the very top. Washington.edu. Sadly, the deadline is, I think, next week through Tuesday or Thursday for, for distance for next year. It isn't out of the question, but it's probably unlikely if people haven't started now. But if anybody's interested in coming to the full-time residential program in Seattle, it's next January. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we would be delighted to have your absolute first class people. And if you want to send the others to San Jose and UCLA and, you know, Michigan and places like that. I've taught at most of those places. I can tell you why we're better. But, you know, I, I mean, we're, we, you know, we're here for you. Um, so, uh, uh, now that the self-serving section of the program is over, we can move on. Uh, i just remind you of my title here. Um, Extending services to the increasingly digital user. And, and I include that parenthetical for a reason, because one of the things that we've all seen over the last 10 years or so, and even less than that, is that people who, well, people just in general, but certainly also people who interact with information through libraries, et cetera, are, are increasingly digital. I, I haven't had a chance to wander on this campus very much, but I wouldn't be surprised if the experience here isn't very much like the experience we have in Seattle at the UW, 
which is that it's really hard to walk about 50 feet on our campus without finding somebody on a cell phone, a PDA, a trio, an iPod, all of those at the same time, people wandering around either talking to themselves or with a little thing in their ear, which you assume means that they're not crazy, that they're actually talking to another person, but you're never entirely sure sometimes. Um, people are just a lot more digital. They're a lot more wired. They're a lot more connected than they used to be. And, and yet, you probably also have the really dedicated print users and the ones who are going to die with a book in their hands and everything in between. And I think that, that is where the, that's where the action is, is the in-between. And it's the migration of what we have been doing for generations extremely well into whatever it is we're going to do from here. So I, I'm, I'm here to talk a little bit with you this morning about the where we go from here piece. Um, but I want to ground that in the where we have been. Um, and the, the sort of undertone, for those of you who are music people, the continuo of this is the, the evolution of the information environment. The, the information environment as we understand it is very different from when I went to school 25 years ago um, and is even different from 5 or 10 years ago. And, and it's different for lots of interesting and different kind of ways. It's not strictly technological. There are demographic changes. There are economic changes. There are changes in the intellectual freedom world. Patriot Act got passed this morning. Um, the renewal of the Patriot Act got passed this morning and is headed to the White House to be signed. Um, intellectual property is up for grabs. Well, actually, intellectual property isn't up for grabs. That's kind of the problem. Um, there's all it's social stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are going on in the information environment. And that is just going to continue to evolve. So the message I give my students and the one I give to all of you is um, we are preparing, I am preparing my students for an information environment none of us can predict, which is very different from when I was in school where I was prepared for an information environment that we could predict and did and were wrong. <laughs> now, we worked it out. And you have all, those of you who are in the profession and have been maybe for even longer than I have, we have figured it out. But we weren't necessarily given the tools to do it. And we didn't think we were going to have to. At least the current generation knows that nothing's ever going to be stable, which I think is an advantage. It may be depressing, but it's an advantage. And, and I think that's an advantage we can continue to use. So let me talk about our, our traditional service base. Um, if you think about, and this is a partial list, but it's a demonstrative list or an illustrative list. Who have we been serving over the generations? Well, we've been serving readers. A um, hundred years ago, that was the generic name for people who use libraries. They were readers a long time ago. Then they were patrons, and then they were users, and now they're somewhere between client and customer and, I don't know, guest. I don't know, whatever the next horrible customer service phrase that comes down the pike is. Uh, I mean, I'm all for readers. I think that's a great old word that covers a lot of territory. Um, and not to mention it pushes reading, which is one of the things we ought to be pushing. But anyway, um, so we've been serving readers, and that takes a lot of, you know, that takes a lot of, there's a lot of scope inherent in the word reader. Um, we always had people we thought of as casual users, drop-ins, people who would just sort of come in and wander around. I mean, okay, there's the people who are sleeping in the stacks, but that's, that's a different category of casual. They're usually more casual, in fact. Um, but the you know people who just sort of come in and wander around and use stuff, and but they're not heavy users of services and so on. Um, we would support searchers, uh, people who had a directed um, mission or project or something they were working on, and they would use fair. We would help them to use fairly traditional tools, things like the catalog, things like. Databases, and that, that was in the days that when databases were bound and sewed together. Um, remember, some of you are old. We're, oh, so we'll just go down memory lane together this morning. Some of you are old enough to remember Social Science Citation Index in print. I used that for my dissertation. This is why I wear these glasses. I could, I mean, for those of you who don't remember it, you're, you're lucky. It was horrible. But we love, you know, it was how we had So. And we've still got a couple of ancient faculty who will not let us stop the subscription to SSCI in print because they've been using it since the year dot, and they're not going to change. Go tell them about Web of Science. Ugh. Anyway, and I never liked Web of Science anyway, but that's another story. Um, so we, interface creeps me out. The, uh, 
uh, databases, and then reference works. And reference works covered a lot of territory. Uh, but these were people who had a direct, who had a specific thing, and we would we would help to facilitate their information needs through some sort of search tool. Uh, those search tools were largely manual um, up until 30 years ago, and then we were in a hybrid phase, and we went to that weird dalliance with CD-ROMs, like we thought that was going to solve all of our problems, and then we just wound up with hundreds of, hundreds of coasters from from UMI, uh, which was or little mini frisbees or whatever. That was fun. Um, uh, then you would get to the hardcore people, the specialized researchers. Now, in an academic context, of course, that's, you have a lot of those kind of people. You have people doing doctoral theses. You have people doing master's work. You have faculty doing research projects. You have undergraduates doing serious research projects. There's, you know, there's all kinds of specialized research. Uh, I think there may be a handful of people from the public library world in the audience. Uh, I mean, you know these people. These are the genealogists or the genies, as they were affectionately, or sometimes less affectionately known. Uh, my mother was a genealogist, so I know entirely whereof I speak. Uh, the local historians, the people who are researching, like, what was written over the men's room door at the train station in 1911 when they were a kid. I mean, I've uh, been there, done that. Um, uh, I mean, these are people on a... And they were using tools and resources in very in-depth, very dedicated kinds of ways, beyond even a good article about X, beyond I want to find a good book in it. Um, and I'll come back to that. We always have served the creative community, but primarily the textual creative community. Uh, it is not unusual to think of a writer coming to spend days, weeks, months in a library, in an archive, um, uh, reserving a carol, uh, having space in a special collections library. Um, it happens all the time. I love reading those acknowledgment sections of books. You know, Oh, where would I have been without the librarians at the University of Oregon? Blah. Uh, great, great, great. Uh, but it's it, it don't necessarily think, or it would be more difficult to think, of an artist a visual artist doing that in a library. You would think of them doing it in a museum, but you, know, you wouldn't necessarily think of somebody setting up an easel in the middle of the reading room, or a musician, or a sculptor, or a choreographer. So we supported a slice of the creative process, but a, the, the slice of the creative process that was in the written word, um, in the text, which is not a surprise since for most of the history of institutions like this one, we traded in the written world word almost exclusively. Yes, you have art books. Yes, you have music books. But they are books. Um, and works of art and, and works of music and works of the other creative arts world, library world. Um, so we focused on the, the creative written word. Um, and of course, we serve and have served learners. That's obvious in an institution like this. It's obvious in a school. It's marginally slightly less obvious of the public library, at least in North America, if you go back to its origins at the turn of the last century, was the public library is the people's university. This was how people, normal in people, um, bettered themselves. Um, it went along with the rise of the public education movement. It went along with the rise of public philanthropy at the turn of the 20th century. And, and so this was the public library was the place that anybody could come and learn uh, without having to have an educational credential. You could just come and do whatever you wanted and learn whatever you wanted. And that was part of the motivation behind the public. Andrew. You know, this notion of the, of, of the public library as a learning institution, as a place where people would go to learn, is not, uh, is not formal. It's really easy to stereotype the public library as someone you want the two-year-old to get board books. And the library to get board books, but I, I think that's a really diminished notion of the mission of a public library. And I think most people agree. So when you look at that list of people, what do they need? OK, any questions? <laughs> um, they need, so this is the technical part of the talk. Words are going to fly, and you should be taking notes because you know this is the kind of stuff you only learn in grad school. Isn't it mortifying when your faculty come and give presentations like this? I'm really ah um, <laughs> oh, crap. 
telling people for weeks this guy was the genius, and he comes and talks about stuff. So yeah, let's talk about stuff. Right down to it, that's what a library is. It's stuff and help and place. You know, I mean, it's different kind of stuff depending on the library. It's different kind of help. It's different kind of place. I, I would add something to this that is a little less obvious. Um, I would add values to this. Um, because we, for example, fight for intellectual freedom. And the library community has been among those been most unhappy about the USA Patriot Act and its fight for equality of access, which is why crazy things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act make blood run out of our eyes. Um, because it's just wrong. It's just wrong. And, you know, all right, just keep Mickey Mouse under copyright un for all eternity and leave the rest of us alone. Is it? I, I think that's a deal worth making. You know, if it's all about Mickey freaking Mouse, forget about Mickey Mouse. You have no exemption. Where, you know, if it's got pants and big ears, it's on copyright until today. Fine. And then let's. Use stuff in a way. Pay attention. So, <laughs> it's even more mortifying now, isn't it? See, but you asked me to come, so poor Tracy's never going to let me forget this. Um, so, stuff and help in place and values, intellectual freedom, um, equality of access, uh, those kinds of things. But at its base, stuff and help in place. I'm going to talk more about stuff and help in place as we go. But that's the traditional set of needs. This is the traditional set of users and to some extent uses. This is the traditional what we did about it. And there are some of these people who need stuff and these people who need a place and some who need all of those or in different combinations. Okay, gotcha. So now, how would we revise that list in an increasingly digital world? So if you were to take that same list and recast it in the terms of 2006, what might it look like? Well, we still have readers, but they're reading different things. They're reading more, a wider variety of things. The codex format, excuse me, it's always good to have a prop. The codex format has been around for about 1900 years. This thing, this object, goes back to about 150 AD. Do you know why, why this started? Nobody knows why this started. You're a bunch of librarians. You don't know why the book started. You should be ashamed. Um, goes back to 150 AD um, and a group of people who needed quick reference to a very important piece of textual to what they needed to do. And that was the early Christians. Uh, the scroll, the papyrus or the parchment scroll was the predominant mechanism in Rome and most of the ancient world up until that point. But the Christians were trying to evangelize and they needed access to a text. And they needed rapid access, and they didn't want to have to, you know, wait. No, I know what you may find it, you know, as you're trying to convert in the street corner without being arrested and thrown to the lions. You need speed. This beats a scroll for speed. It's less great storage, but it meets a, it, it beats the scroll for speed. The, so going anywhere, because it has endured all this time for a lot of reasons, and it still works. There are now other forms book, which has come and gone. gone and, you know, despite the efforts of Net Library to kill off the notion of electronic books <laughs> by having the worst possible implementation, it goes on. You know? um, and now the big deal is audio, downloadable audio books, which I think is the single greatest idea I ever heard. If only you could use them on a stupid iPod, which at least King County and Seattle Public have not yet been able to make work. But that's Apple's problem. Um, the, so the book persists. It may not always look like this. It may not always be a codex, but it will be the book in some sort of format will be around. So, but the reading thing I think is still really important. And I think that's still a great opportunity for us, for the library world, is the reading thing and the popularity of uh, downloadable audiobooks, which have just exploded in the last year. I think is real evidence of that. Um, when you think about casual users, people who kind of just dropped in, I think that's web surfers. I, you know, that's the touch on your website and then go away. You know, oh, I wonder what the University of Oregon Library has. Um, now, here's a question. Do you count them in your usage statistics? 
It's an oil painting. Everybody's looking at somebody else like, isn't that your job? Aren't you supposed to count these people? The person who's supposed to count these people isn't here, right? So we can blame them. Um, I mean, that's a real, that's, I mean, do you count gate traffic? Do you count number of bodies who walk in the door? Okay, so somebody's got to own up to this eventually. Thank you. So, yeah, this is driving me nuts. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? I don't, I don't use a microphone unless I absolutely have to. So the, 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 now I, look, you can see me. I have a body and everything. Um, the, the counting people who walk in the door, I don't think there's any difference between that and counting people who hit your website once. 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 It doesn't matter. They're in the library. Uh, that's one of the cases I'm going to make here really strongly is those people are in the library. They may not be here for very long, but they're in the library. And, I mean, that's something we just have to kind of acknowledge that that kind of use is going to be increasingly common. And people are going to come into your website on any random page. Not to mention Summit. You know, how many times have I been in your library by starting it with the UW catalog and winding up at Summit? I've borrowed at least a half a dozen books from you all through Summit. Thank you, by the way. Um, you have things UW doesn't have, which, hmm, you know, Yay. Um, and thank you for shipping them up to me. And I mean, in a, in a way, that's, uh, you know, I'm in your library when I'm even in Summit. Even if I'm not on your catalog, I'm in Summit. Um, the searchers that we continue to support have been using, continue to use those traditional tools, and now they're using web search tools. So what you, if you look at sort of the history of search, it's just getting bigger. More options more tools, more things to find. And of course, search is now commoditized. The notion of search is now a business. Search is the, you know, the search market, the search business, the MSN, Windows Live, Yahoo, Googles of the world don't care about search. They care about advertising. And search is a means to an end. They want their tools to be good. They want their tools to be effective because then they'll be used. But they are, they are less interested in a high-quality search experience for you than that you occasionally click through to their advertisers because that's what gets them money. Good search doesn't get them money. Clicking through to advertisers gets them money. So search is a means to an end. For us, it was the end. You know, it's a means to an end for patrons, normal people, because they have lives and jobs and they want to find stuff. We, whose lives and jobs it is to help them find stuff, search was the point. Search was what we knew. I mean, those of you who are reference librarians as long as I am, that was the thing. We knew how to do that better than anybody else in the world, was how to search and where to search and when to stop. When to stop. <gasps> this is one of my favorite questions. My mother, bless her soul, a librarian, came to visit me once when I was teaching at Michigan, and I was teaching online searching, and somebody in the back of the room said, when do you stop <laughs> searching? <laughs> And I gave the answer I've been given for the last 20 years, which is, when you're done. This was not satisfying. It isn't any more satisfying now than it was 20 years ago. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, don't these people know that by now? I'm like, well, they do now, you know. Huh? <laughs> you stop when you're done. You stop when you ain't finding anything. You stop when you're finding too much. You stop when you're confused. You stop when you really don't have anything left to do. You stop when you're bored. You stop when your shift is over. I mean, there's, you know. <laughs> you stop when you think you can legitimately get rid of somebody because they're bugging the heck out of you. Sometimes they stop before you stop because you're interested and they're not. And how many of you have chased them out of the building? Wait, I found something else. I did that once. I literally was chasing somebody out of the building, brandishing the statistical abstract at them. Wait, wait. She didn't call security. I was very pleased with that. Um, Searching just is getting bigger and bigger. And now there's web searching tools. And then, you know, the invisible web, what we have been calling the invisible web, all the web stuff that is behind password protection and credit card numbers and authentication barriers and things like that. Um, if, you look at, if you look at particularly what Google has done over the last year or two, and by extension the other companies, because they're all kind of chasing Google in a lot of ways, they are systematically going after every chunk of search that they didn't do before. So I used to say that searching Google was a slice of a slice of a slice of the information world, that you were unable to get the invisible web through Google, you were unable to get 
digital stuff that was not webized and you were unable to get at print? Well, Google Book Search, Google Scholar are just taking those chunks. So they, they recognized that there was stuff they were not getting access to. They were not providing access to. And they are providing access to it by scanning millions of books. Probably in flagrant violation of international copyright law, but go explain that to them. Google Scholar. They're just harvesting all of this unbelievably appalling metadata about scholarly stuff on the web and passing it off as a tool, which now every undergraduate in the known universe goes to first. Yes? Ah, because it's there. And, you know, who wants to be bothered with ProQuest? What the hell is ProQuest when it's in Google? Anyway, <laughs> don't even get me started. Um, so, but search, search is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and is a different world than the world we start, many of us started with. Um, the specialized researchers, the people who would come and set up camp and they're researching their family history or the history of the city or whatever, that's fine, but now they don't necessarily have to come. They don't have to set up camp. And have any of you gotten the email from somebody in Indiana who wants you to like scan 500 pages of stuff because well, because I don't want to fly to Corvallis, you know. Okay, I think you need to fly to Corvallis. I think, you know, I mean, I mean, we're just not set up for that. This notion of remote, intensive users. People who are not necessarily even part of your institutional community. I mean, distance education students aside, that's a different thing. Although we haven't fully figured that one out yet either. Um, and we're relying on... <laughs> Our friends and neighbors and colleagues around the country to sort of take up the slack for that. Thank you, by the way. Um, but we, you know, the intense user who isn't in your building is a growing, is a potentially growing phenomenon of people who just will have an expectation that they can send an email and the University of Oregon will send them stuff because that's what libraries do. And we just have to work out whether or not that's what libraries do. That's a decision. We haven't. You know, if somebody were to have written you a letter 50 years ago or 20 years ago or seven saying, please, you know, print out these 600 pages of microfilm for me and send it to me, I'm thinking they get a different letter back. I'm thinking they get a bill or a phone call or something like, yeah, we'd be happy to do that for you for 50 bucks or 100 bucks or, you know, $10 an hour or whatever. But, you know, can you just ship me some PDFs? That's a little, di there's a different set of expectations there. And that's just a choice for us. Do we do that or not? And why and how? So I got no, so I'm not a blogger. I'm not a blogger. I get it, but I'm not a blogger. But the, you know, that's, that's a creative format that has very rapidly become a big deal. And I think it's worth reflecting on what, libraries can, ought, should, shouldn't do to support that community. Because I will wager a very small fraction of that community thinks of the library world as a place to support their work. I'm guessing they don't think they need much support at all. I'm guessing they think of themselves as a self-sustaining kind of, you know, confederation of people. Um, they've got their own sphere, so, you know, I mean, that, that word alone connotes to me self-containment, the blogosphere. That, to me, if you're in a sphere, you don't necessarily connect to anything else. So that word alone kind of gives you insight. Um, should we be bothered that they don't, that there is not a huge outreach from our community to theirs and vice versa? Should that bother us? I think it probably ought to. I think, you know, this is, this is becoming a big enough deal. This is becoming enough of a presence in the business world, in the government world, in the journalism world, um, in a lot of different realms, that it ought to at least enter into the conversation about how, about people who might be, because these are intensive users of information, but they ain't library users. I, I guess. I don't have any hard evidence to that effect, but I'm guessing. Um, and there are a lot of people writing books, magazine articles in the traditional formats, and there's a lot of people write, creating all kinds of digital objects. 
like websites, digital music, digital film, digital scrapbooks, all kinds of things. And you know, if you're people who buy Macintosh computers now, not iPods, but Macintosh computers, those are just glorified film editing machines now. I mean, they come with all of this music and video editing software, and then, oh, by the way, you can word process, and oh, by the way, you can do email, but ooh, look, I can make my video spin, ooh. So this, the notion of digital object creation and the creative process in general, I think, is really on the table here. Fifty years ago, it would not have been uncommon to find typewriters in libraries for people to use, to write, to work on writ writ written works. So, I mean, is there an analog to that today? to have digital video software, um, to have uh, hardware to support this sort of stuff, to have staff and resources to support it. Um, I, I, among my little forays over the last few weeks, I went to the um, Orange County Library in Orlando. Um, really interesting place. And they offer classes on how to podcast. And a little brochure on, so you want a podcast? with like step-by-step -step instructions and arrows and things. Very impressive, very impressive. Um, and it gets used, they get a lot of people, and digital movie creation and so on and so forth. I thought that was very interesting because they realized that was, they had people who wanted to do that and that was information stuff. So they were doing it. Um, and distance education students, I've talked about them. Um, and that's a two-way street, I don't know if UO does much distance. Um, but you've got distance students, so you've got students all over the place, or all over some place, and they're making use of their local resources to try to support um, their education. Not to mention you must have, um, in Eugene and the, in the surrounding area, distance education students from other institutions who are coming, in, coming here to try to use your resources in subject areas you don't cover, because if you did, they'd be going to UO. Um, <laughs> so, hi, I'm studying oceanography. What do you got? I don't know if you have much oceanography at UO, but you know there's got to be something you don't have that people are coming to you from. That's just we don't, we, you know, we just haven't worked that one out yet. But those are people who are again intensive information users, and we just have to think about what kind of needs they have. Some of these are the same kind of people who know the library bit and know what library services are all about, and they get it. Some of these people are not, and they will not think about libraries as a place to do their work or support their work. Um, and, to be honest, there are probably people who have been dedicated library users who are drifting away either because their needs are being met elsewhere through, I don't know, Amazon, iTunes, um, whatever, or they see the kinds of things that are happening in libraries and they feel less comfortable there. I mean, I think that's just, it's just necessary to talk about that. Um, I, I think we lost people when we went to digital catalogs. I think that was a barrier to some people. Not that we shouldn't have done it. We should have done it. Um, and we probably did it in the best way we possibly could have. But, and we had that weird, did you have, anybody live through the microfilm catalog phase? Oh, what a horrible idea that was. Um, oh, we have so many sins to answer for when we go to that great reference desk in the sky, don't we? Um, that was just, oh, it was just a bad idea. And they all had cute names to try to make it look like it was less wretched than it really was. Ours had a cat on it. They all have cats on them. I mean, it's librarians. What are you going to do? Anyway, um, uh, uh, I mean, I think we lost people. We lost people who just liked the card catalog, who felt comfortable with it, who'd used it their whole lives, and they saw it went away, and it's like, all right, I don't need to go to the library anymore. Not a lot, but I think we gained people at the same time, but it's a trade-off. And none of these are, you know, without risk. So, when you look at this new crop of people, what do they need? Stuff and help in place. But I think the stuff and help in place paradigm changes when you're talking about increasingly digital people. So let's talk about stuff for a second. Um, clearly, an increasingly digital audience wants increasingly digital stuff. That is not a surprise. Um, Accessible and usable. Now, there is digital stuff that is neither accessible nor usable. We won't rehearse all of that. But they want access. And I think a lot of this reduces to access, is that people are now accustomed to, I can do it better. There you go. 
I can even do it there. <laughs> that took me three years to learn how to do that. Um, and this is how I choose to use that skill. Uh, they want it. They want it. And they want it right now. And they want it where? You know, they just want it. And I, we are not used to that. This, we are not a, this kind of profession. With the exception of ready reference, which is probably dead. We'll get back to that later. Or, or dying. Uh, we're not a kind of profession. We're a, hey, that's a good idea. Let's see what we can find kind of profession. Um, and institutions to support it. And we got to figure that out. Um, just as, a, as an aside, this creative commons idea. Um, so I want to talk about creative commons in two senses. One is the very narrow sense of the creative commons, capital C, capital C, which if you don't know very much about it, it is worth looking at. This is the let's take back copyright um, because the, because the mouse is killing us all, um, uh, or the copy left movement, as it's sometimes called, which I love that word. Um, uh, it's a way for people to, to set out very explicitly and somewhat simply what rights they're willing to give away for their creative works and register it in a central site. It's creativecommons.org. If you don't know it, it's certainly worth looking at um, and a very interesting idea. And one of those only after the internet can you think about it kind of ideas because it couldn't possibly have sustained in a, in a pre-network kind of world. Um, the larger sense of creative commons, though, is that you have creative works that live in a kind of common environment and can be shared and used and repurposed and um, thought about in very different ways than you know stuff stuck in things like this. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's almost more like an oral culture. If you think about what um, epic poetry was like in a pre-written culture, where I mean, we know, for example, the Iliad um, was was oral tradition for generations, for centuries. Beowulf, um, the Icelandic sagas, all of those were the songs of the troubadours. All of them were handed down and oral, and and so there is no. I mean, there's authoritative texts, but they're all guesses or the final versions, etc. Um, this is almost back to that kind of culture where you're just you know borrowing and, and lending and using and reusing and, and contributing. And, and I mean, I think that's a really interesting idea and one that is not foreign to the library world. I mean, I think that's an area where we could really um, have some interesting contributions if we so chose. Um, so stuff. Help. Um, so people need help in much the same way that they have always needed help. They need help in searching and finding, which are two different things. Uh, <laughs> and any expert searcher will tell you that. We could trade war stories later if you like. Accessing, using, understanding, and evaluating. Um, and even instruction where appropriate. Um, and clearly the information literacy movement, the instructional movement, um, which comes right out of bibliographic instruction and a lot in a long tradition of, of education and pedagogy in libraries, especially in academic libraries and school libraries over the last few decades. Um, they just need that kind of support. And that's, you know, these are different tools and they're different environments and they're different ways of searching. But, you know, I still teach most specific first and pearl growing and control vocabulary searching and truncation operators and things like that. They're just all different. But the, you know, the mechanisms are different, but the ideas are the same. And we know things about searching that a lot of other people don't know. Um, I, the last, over the last year, I've been twice over to Microsoft, um, where they bring this group of people who are experts in search together to help them to tell them why MSN sucks. It's not as hard as it sounds, you know. I, I, um, the, even they gave me the lovely backpack. Um, the search champs, they call it, which is a stupid name. Um, but, you know, hey, we got a nice meal out of it at Wild Ginger in Seattle. Um, and the, um, so the first time I went, I was the only librarian. I was the only, even, I mean, I didn't even practice. Who the hell am I? I was the only person who was even remotely uh, a practicing librarian. There were a couple people who were researchers who had backgrounds in the field, but there was nobody else. This last time, just a few weeks ago, there were several. Walt Crawford was there. Jenny Levine was, Jenny Levine was there. Um, Mary Ellen Bates was there. There was like six or eight of us who were librarians. Um, Charles Bailey. Um, and, and so we, you know, hey, there are things we know about search that you all don't. It's, it's amazing the, thing, the questions. 
So you have all these very earnest Microsoft people. You know, you have to be earnest if you work at Microsoft because you don't last very long if you're not. And they all have their little laptops, and they're all sitting in the back of the room typing away. We assumed they were actually listening to what we were talking about. We were having a good time. Who knows what they were doing? But it didn't really matter because, you know, we got a nice dinner at Wild Ginger out of it. And so they're typing. Through, and they ask these very earnest questions about, so what do people want when they're looking for books? <laughs> they're trying to compete with Google Book Search. What do you, well, they want books. You know, they want, they want to read. They want to learn. Oh, they want to read. They want to learn. This is... <laughs> I mean, they're very bright people. They wouldn't be bright if they weren't working. If they were working at Microsoft, they have to be bright. If they weren't, they wouldn't last very long. But they were just, I mean, they're Microsofties. They're just not like the rest of us. People want to learn. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is so cool. You got all their feedback is so great. You got to get out every once in a while. You know, you're, uh, come on the other side of the lake. It's fun over here. Um, they, want, they need connectivity. They need connection. And those are two different things. I mean connectivity both in the kind of digital networking sense, but also, you know, bandwidth, like face-to-face, person-to-person, chat with each other kind of stuff. Um, and connectivity and bandwidth. And so, I mean, I think that's an interesting area of help. Um, you know, how many times have you worked with somebody doing a great database search and then they can't email it to themselves? That's a failed search. There is no functional difference between that and something where they can't come up with a search term. You know, and all of the library science in the world don't help you if you can't email the foolish thing to yourself, or if it won't print out, or if the heart, you know, the the you can't save it to disk. So there are aspects of help of what we think of as reference librarianship that's, you know, saving stuff to disk and emailing it to yourself and making a printer work and you know, it's, it's not glamorous, and it's not fancy, but it's a piece of the puzzle. It's the last five feet. And the first 20 miles don't matter if the last five feet fail. So I'm no happier about it either. But I've learned. I, I have spent, I'm not doing it lately, but I have spent a couple hours a week on the main reference desk at Susilo Library at, at the UW campus. Um, and so I've seen these people. And I've worked really hard to make the stupid thing email to somebody in a PDF format or some goofy thing that would work after 20 minutes of banging your head against the wall. But I'm, I'm calm now. Um, and people want help. I, I, you know, I, this is, so people want help, people want help. So welcome to Tautology Central. Um, it's, a, it's a crazy, confusing world. And it's getting more so all the time. And people sometimes just want to be told what to do or what not to do, or where to go, or what to look for. And, and I run into this all the time. I travel quite a bit, which I enjoy. But so I'm going to St. Louis in a few months. No, I'm going to Helsinki next week. Which, OK, if somebody said, go try to read Finnish, it's like somebody fell asleep on the keyboard. <laughs> Words this long with vowels, Ks, and Ns. That's all it is. Blah, 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 blah. So you can't even make sense out of it. So I'm trying to figure out what to do in Helsinki in March, other than freeze. I think I can do the freezing part. And it's not easy, because who do you trust to tell you what the good restaurants are in Helsinki, or what you know, touristy things you can legitimately do in March in Helsinki without dying of cold? And it, it's just, there are too many sources, and they're not all, you know, you fall back on the Fodors and Fromers and Lonely Planets because they're brand names you know, but that could be stinky advice. How do I know that Fromers knows anything about Helsinki and that it's l less than five years old advice? So getting help, getting advice, being, t and, and the search world recognizes this. The, the commercial search world recognizes this because this is now recommendation engines and social tagging. And six out of nine people were found this review helpful. And they recognize that sometimes people want help. My best example of, of people just sometimes just want to know what to do is the TV Guide. OK, first of all, the TV Guide is now effectively Entertainment Weekly with TV listings, they, People Magazine with TV listings. They gave up on the, I mean, it's bigger format and everything. But when I was growing up, we had four channels. So the TV Guide was narrative. 
da -da -da -da, 8 o'clock, channel 3, channel 5, channel 9, channel 24. That was all there was to it. Now, you know, there's about 40 billion channels. And now you have the grid. And the grid is a time-saving device. The grid is an attention-saving device. Because you don't have time, after a long, hard day of, you know, toiling away in the library mines, you don't have time to fart around with, you know, what's on lifetime. You want to see the grid. So you look at the grid. And the grid will say things like, if it's in shaded gray, it's sports. And if it's white and black, it's a movie. Those are all attention-saving devices. And in a world where the scarce commodity is not information, the scarce commodity is human attention, you look for attention-saving devices and guidance and help. And we as a profession have shied away from guidance to some extent. You know, we would give people options. We would make recommendations. We would tell people, here are six good books you might like. You know, if my accountant said that to me, I would fire him. There are six different lines you could put this on on your tax form. No, Sparky, there's one. <laughs> and I'm paying you to tell me which one it is so that I don't go to jail and I don't have to pay any money, okay? You know, oh, there's six different lawsuits we could file. No, there's one. You know, your lawyer doesn't do that. Your doctor doesn't do that. Your, your accountant doesn't do that. Your, you know, lots of professions tell you what to do. Now, you rebel against that. You fight. You squirm. You ignore. That's fine. But, you know, professions you pay tell you what to do. Professions who get paid in the background and there's no exchange of... I always think if we had tip jars, we might be better off. You know, put a tip jar on the reference desk. See how that changes the conversation, you know? <laughs> yes, I can answer that question for you. It's 15 bucks, and I'll tell you what to do. I bet you get people to take it. Look at Google Answers. There's people paying money. It's like eBay for reference librarianship. They're not very good answers, by the way. But, you know, you get what you pay for. When you're paying $2 for some huge reference project, research project, you know, what do you expect? Um, I, I think it's worth investigating the idea of how much advice do we give people? How much do we tell them what to do? And because they just want to move on. This is the other thing. that it, it, We all know this, but you don't know it until somebody says it. For 99% of the people in the world, the process of search is uninteresting. They don't care. They want an answer. They want to figure out where to send their kid to college. They want to get their car fixed. They want to know how much great aunt Sadie's silver candelabra is worth. You know, they want to know, they want to get on with their lives, they want to move, they want to do something. For 1% of the world, the process of search is interesting. These are librarians. Everybody else just wants to get on with their lives. So when you find those people who love what you're doing and they're like taking notes on your search technique and so on, iSchool.Washington.edu, <laughs> send them to me. I know what to do with these people. I've been doing this 25 years. I know what to do with them. But for the rest of them who are like, thank you, who are done before you are, and you're chasing them out of the building, just leave them alone. They're done. They just want to know. And it doesn't even have to be great. So they don't care about the process. So, but they do care about getting a good answer, generally. So you know, tell, every once in a while, it's OK to tell them what to do. Oh, and it has to be everywhere all the time, like you didn't know that. Um, the, the other effect of the network world is that barriers of place and time are shot. It doesn't matter. So people can email you at 3 o'clock in the morning, or they expect your chat service to be up 24 hours a day, or they expect you know, a detailed answer to some horrific question at the drop of a hat. Some of that we can do something about, a lot of it we can't, but this notion of ubiquity in place and time, I think, cannot be escaped because it just is part of the equation. Um, I'm going to suggest a strategic move now, and I'm going to reinforce it, that one way we can compete in this world is things like depth and length. Is that, so I'll come back to ready reference. I'm going to, I'm going to say this a couple of times. Ready reference, I was born to be a ready reference librarian. My mother bought me the World Almanac every year for Christmas. I read it from cover to cover. They moved the index. I didn't know it for three years. I never used the index of the World Almanac. Who uses it? That's for, that's for dopes. I know where everything is. Da, 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 da. I was born to be a ready reference librarian. It's in my blood. I think that ship has sailed. I think if we, I just don't think we can, 
I don't think that should be very high on the list of priorities for librarianship anymore. I just don't. Because it's a losing proposition. Because Google will beat us nine times out of ten at speed and possibly even at performance. Yeah, I know what Google gets. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But people don't care. And it's good enough. And they won't think of us anyway. So staffing a ready reference desk with highly trained, highly skilled, highly paid professionals standing there staring at each other, I don't think makes a lot of sense. I just don't. And I have no joy in saying that. But I just think it's, it's hard to deny that that's the case. Now, research, deeper investigation, in the public library context, local history and genealogy. In the academic library context, research projects, research consultations, um, dissertation support, faculty support, instructional support. Absolutely. I would way rather have highly trained reference librarians work, you know, working as team members on research projects of faculty who are submitting grants than finding the capital of Bolivia. Uh, you know, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, that is a much more satisfying, fully featured professional domain. And frankly, that's what we ought to do. I mean, we went through the Bolivia phase. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, nice. You know, help, help people in ways they need help in the deeper, longer, unmet needs. Um, and they need place, not to forget place. Um, and they need all of these. They need a place to start their work. They need a place to finish. They need a place to continue. And they need a place to be. Now, that place to be, uh, you can figure the first part out, um, physically and virtually. Um, you know what physical space is important as for meetings, for you know, having the stuff, for having a sort of locus for your work, et cetera. Uh, I think a virtual place to be is also a piece of this. Um, and and in a, you know, the, the virtual world is even more disconnected and, and dis disjointed. Um, than the physical world is, and so having some sense of location, centrality, um, place in an inherently placeless kind of environment, um, I think is really important, and I think people are seeking that. And libraries, libraries still have this connotation of solidity and and gravity, in both senses of that word, and and I think that's that can be built upon and played upon. So that's all what they need. This is what they want. Yes? OK. And the most important of those is good enough. Because for most people, good enough is good enough. And so that's why Google works. You know, Google's, Google does great. I love Google. But, it, it, and I know better. <laughs> I know a lot better. And I know times that I should be going to ProQuest. <coughs> <laughs> I don't have any issues with ProQuest. It's just, you know, if they'd stop changing the interface, I'd be just as happy about it. Um, but I know better. But for most people, it's a quick, cheap, easy, good enough kind of world. Um, so that's what they want. Um, and how do we fit? We kind of don't. You know, uh, this is my graphics. <laughs> Which I have to admit, it does that automatically if you type the frowny face as an emoticon. So I didn't even put that in there. It did it for me automatically, which creeped me out for a second. Then I'm like, OK, that's fine. Um, so this is the high tech world tomorrow I live in. It's like, ooh, PowerPoint makes a smiley face for you. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't make it animate if I tried. So this is as high as, this is as high tech as I get. Um, so I have a few ideas. We do fit in this world. But it isn't a natural fit. And it isn't a natural fit from either our perspective or theirs. I think we have to tell people what we do. I, one of the things that hit me in the, in the, right between the eyes with a plank when I was working on a reference desk is almost every single person I worked with said, I didn't know a librarian would do this. Well, what the hell did you think we did? I know what they think we do. We shush people, we dust books, we memorize the Dewey Decimal System. You know, we have deep conversations about the 330s or whatever. I don't even know what that is. And they, but they don't, you know. I, I had a young man who literally every four minutes was done. And we were still working on this topic, and it was really interesting. And he just, after like 25 minutes of working with him, said, I have not spent this much time with a librarian in my entire life. This was a junior in college. 
And the real secret why that's the case, I shouldn't say this on videotape, but I say it all over the world, is because there's a lot of stinky librarians who work with children. They're the most important librarians we have. The librarians who work with children are the most important because every customer service person in the world will tell you early experience controls future opinion. And all it takes is one stinky children's librarian who is mean to you and won't let you read Judy Bloom or Kurt Vonnegut or Isaac Asimov or whatever um, turns people off from libraries their entire life. I heard that, I've heard that story more times than I can tell you. She was so mean. Get her name. I want her name. I want names. <laughs> I can take care of this. Just. Um, uh, so here's a few ideas about reference. When you think about reference, you think about stuff like this. You think about search, you think about collection development, you think about reader's advisory, um, which doesn't immediately flow in the academic world, but I think it's there. And you think about education. If you stop using the word reference, because by the way, it doesn't mean anything really. Anybody know why it's called reference? So why do we call it that if nobody knows? Um, think of it as mediation. Think of it as helping people to find things they need to fulfill their information needs. If you reorient thinking away from reference towards mediation, and there's nothing magic about the word mediation, but the concept, then other things start to flow, like helping people build websites that can be found by search engines. Who better than a profession that is dedicated to finding things to help you to be found? There are a lot of people who want to be found. They, they're building a, a family scrapbook and they want to be found on Google. They're building a business. They're building, a, they're building something and they want to be found. Um, I think there's a tech support aspect to this. I've talked about that. Um, helping people to produce and package information in the creative process, I, I think, is an area where we have skills already, and, and we could use those. I think marketing is reference. Helping people to understand what you do and why and how is a piece of helping them fulfill their information needs. If they don't know what you have and what you can do, they're not going to ask you for it. We know that people ask for what they think you have, which is why people come to reference desks and they say, do you have any books about X? They ask you for books because that's what they think you have. Well, we do. I mean, look around. But there's a lot of other stuff as well. You know, how frequently do people come and say, I'm looking for a website about X? Well, they probably do. But they don't think you have it. They think you're a means to that end. Do they ever ask you for microfilm? Do they ever ask you for sound recordings? Do they ever ask you for blogs? Do they ever ask you? No, because they're not thinking that way. They think of us as the, te as the written word, and understandably. Um, I think there's a web design tool building aspect to this as well. I think this, if you just broaden the notion of what, what we are here to do and what we can legitimately do, um, and what we can legitimately do better than anybody else can do, you know, it just starts to open up a lot of other possibilities. But if you think of what we do as reference, you get stuck there. And then it becomes, how do we redo reference, which is the wrong question. Um, one of the things that we do better than almost any other profession is a service orientation. That's what we do. And so these are stupid phrases, but they get you the idea. Uh, you know, I mean, you can, get, you, you, know, you can find stuff for yourself, but when it really matters, you should talk to us. This gets at deeper need. When, people, when there's a lot on the line, when, 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 it, when the need is really important, uh, this is where a librarian can help. Um, and, and I think helping people to understand that that is, in fact, what we do, that we will take the 20 minutes or the five minutes or the, tw or the, or the hour in a, in a consultation or an interview or the several weeks in a team research project. I mean, I, that rethinking through ourselves what we can do and then helping our communities to understand that a little bit better, I think, could pay big dividends. Um, and in a 24-7 kind of world, lowercase 24-7, um, building tools that help people without direct intervention. Um, I, I still have students who think I invented Pathfinders, you know, because I have people make Pathfinders in my classes. Uh, that's a great old tool of, you know, here are ways to start your research in a particular area or subject domain. Here's, you know, um, uh, 
databases you can go to. Here's websites. Here's people. Here's organizations. Here's words you can use to search it. Here are the seminal books. Here's an encyclopedia article. Here are the three best websites. That, that form is amenable to the web environment. It's brilliant. It works like a charm. Slightly repurposed from things I learned, people, things we were teaching 50 years ago. It's great stuff. And I think that's, a, that's an example of things we can do. You know, I, I, every library website you look at says things like, here's our catalog, here's our databases, here's, you know, which is not what people are looking for. People want a book. People want an article. People want help. People want, you know, repurposing, re renaming, nomenclature. You say citation to people, they think parking ticket. You say database, scary governmental thing that holds my personal information, you know, or my credit card company gave me up or whatever. You say index, they think the back of the book. You say catalog, they think land's end. You know, they're just not, we use these words and we know what they mean and it's like any professional jargon, but our professional jargon is so easily confused with everyday uses of these words that people just don't know what we're talking about. Oh, do you have the citation for that article? Uh, 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 and who wants to look like an idiot and say, I don't know what you mean by that? So how, just the language we use and the way we present these things on our websites and, and services and so on, and ABI Inform is my great example of that. If that is not the worst database name in the known universe, I can't tell you what is. Because it doesn't mean anything. Um, and then lots of links to services and make them easy to find. So. Uh, you know, it, it, having links to not only the library website but also to an Ask a Librarian service from the institutional homepage. Um, for those of you here at UO, you know where it would be really cool to have your link? On the Athletics Department page. Because who comes to the OU data, who comes to the OU web world? But, you know, fans. Well, hey, you can be there. So there, all the ducks all over the world can come to you. That's not a bad deal. I, sp I speak as a dedicated sports fan, which is why I, you know, I'm often trying to find things on sports websites and it's really, sports team websites and it's really hard. So I'm like, where's the librarian to help me find this dumb thing? And you can't find a link and it's three, three clicks away. Make stuff easy to find. Um, for those of you in a public library, um, is, is there a link to you from the Chamber of Commerce? Uh, in the academic context, is there a link to you from the alumni website? Um, things like that. Just, you know, make it, Make it, un make it really hard not to find you or not to be found because then, be, then people will find you. Um, and, you know, position ourselves as, and our services as time savers. Uh, this is the I've been searching Google for 45 minutes phenomenon, which totally floors me, but it happens all the time. The uh, research has shown us, and this is by the search engine companies, the average amount of time, the average amount of time people spend searching a web, uh, a web search engine like Google from the time they start to the time they find something is 11 minutes, which is a long time. And that's the average. There's a lot of 30 seconds and 10 seconds in there. So there's people who are searching, using search tools for a half an hour. Well. There's no reason they should be searching. I mean, a, Google, a half hour Google search is, is a contradiction in terms. It's an oxymoron. So, I mean, that's, that's where we fit. Now, how we get those people is another story. But that's where we fit, is those kinds of searches, those kinds of needs. And we have to be in people's minds when they're doing that kind of search so that they will, event, they will find us through all those ubiquitous links. And the bottom line of a lot of this, and you've heard me say this in different ways all morning, is we have to decide as a profession what we are best suited for. Where do our skills and talents and experiences and resources best position us? And these are choices. These are decisions we can make that we are going to focus on research consultations with students and faculty and alumni and staff. We are going to focus on local history and genealogy. We are going to focus on supporting the creative process of our community. We are going to focus on this. And probably that means things you're not going to focus on because you can't do everything. Because I doubt large chunks of money are coming to you.
from the legislature or your chamber or your city council or anywhere else. So given the resource base that you have, financial, informational, technological, and most importantly, human, how do you make the, make the decisions on what it is you want to do, what you can do better than anybody else, and then how do you engineer that? How do you staff for that? How do you pay for that? How do you organize that? How do you market that? How do you run that? How do you weave that into what you do today? That is the challenge of librarianship in the, at the dawn of the 21st century, which is a very different challenge than 25 years ago. And it's a challenge that none of us really knew we were up against, but now we kind of do. So on the one hand, it's like, oh, dear God, now what do we do? On the other hand, our generations, plural, have the opportunity to remake the face of librarianship. Librarianship will be different by the time our generations leave it, either in a vibrant and exciting way or because we're gone. So here's the alarmist part. And I, I mean, you, if you're paying attention, you can see it. You can see the end. It is not that far away. I don't think it's going to happen because I think we will figure it out. But it's there. And, you know, Salinas, we can all scare each other with Salinas. Boo! You know, <laughs> Salinas Public Library. Boo! Poor people, they've become a punchline. But, but they figured it out. They solved it. But they're the, you know, they're the poster children now for pay attention. Or, or the knock will come at the door. And the knock came at the door. And they figured it out. Stevens County, Washington was the other. Um, where they almost voted themselves out of existence. But they managed to, one librarian, bless her heart, saved them. Um, oh, and, well. So, brrr, decide what kind of things we are best suited for, and that probably means giving stuff up. That probably means not doing things. And probably means not doing things that some of us have cherished for a very long time. Which is going to sting and hurt and leave a mark. And it's going to make some people very unhappy. And it might drive a few people out of the profession which is unfortunate, but okay. Because to be honest, a librarian who can't live in this world shouldn't be a librarian. I, you know, I, I've met a few of these people. They're lovely, dedicated people. I know exactly who they are. They walked into a profession with a set of expectations that all got knocked out from underneath them. And it's a terrible thing to have happen, to go into a profession that you dearly love and cherish and respect and honor and revere and you can't live on reverence. you got to move on. And if you can't move on, you should move on. So uh, nobody in this room I know, and nobody any of you know, but there are people in the profession who, you know, not, of course, the president of the ALA. That would be, you know, I mean, that would be wrong. <laughs> if we had a president of the ALA who was stuck in the 1960s, wouldn't that suck? <gasps> Boy, wouldn't that be awful. Anyway. I'm sorry, I had a little moment there. <laughs> I was in a dream state for a second. Um, uh, you know, I mean, those people should just get out of the profession because they're, do they're, they're doing us active harm. So if you ever run into any of them at ALA, just you know, tell them to move on. Anyway, nobody here, nobody in the state of Oregon, nobody in the state of Washington, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, but there's just things we shouldn't do anymore because they're just not worth it. They're just not worth it. It's a, you know, I mean, reminisce, grieve, Cry, have a wake, drive a wooden stake through something, whatever you got to do. But mm, it just, the clock is ticking louder by the day. Um, I, I wanted to just talk about a few things that I see as, as sort of trends and suggestions for you to think about in the reference world. And these, I think, are steps along the way. Um, I mentioned ubiquity. There's. Um, um, the, the digital ubiquity has been around for several years now. So this is email-based reference, chat-based reference. Um, what I'm seeing a lot these days is instant messaging-based reference. I don't know if that's going on here yet. Yeah, I'm a big fan of instant messaging. I'm an instant message user. Um, I love it. Well, yeah, I love it, actually. I kind of do. Um, and uh, I mean, as much as you can love a technology. I love my iPod. You know, I'm very happy with instant messaging. Let's put it that way. Um, and I think, you know, for an undergraduate kind of audience, I hope your experience with undergraduates in particular has been a good one. 
that, that's getting used and people are like, I mean, it's a little, it's a hurdle for librarians to get over because we like to capitalize <laughs> and spell and punctuate. And once you get over having to spell and capitalize and punctuate, it's very liberating. You know, what are you up to? Ah! <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's freeing your inner teenager. It's kind of cool. Um, uh, I mean, that kind of ubiquity has been around for a while. The next level of ubiquity is in real time in face-to-face, -face, and this is the notion of roving, um, which is an old idea, and it's very much, it's a Walmart idea, which, okay, ick, but, um, you know, having somebody to greet you um, when you walk in the door. It's just, it's, you know, it creeps people out for a second, and they like it. And Walmart, you've got to admit, is brilliant that they have old people do it. Old people are non-threatening, they're like your grandmother, whatever. Hi, oh, that's right, I wanted to buy plywood. Whatever. I mean, it works for Walmart. Why didn't it work for us? Not that you should, well, maybe you could put the decrepit librarians up front. <laughs> no, that's probably a bad idea. Um, uh, you know, but just, uh, I mean, uh, the, I forget who it was I heard this. I think it's, it's not Best Buy. It's some retail outlet that has a rule for its staff that if you're within 10 feet of a customer, you have to talk to them. I think is a little much, because um, <laughs> I really don't want to talk to anybody in Best Buy, because they're kind of scaring me. But it took me six months to buy a television. <laughs> Not great with technology. Anyway, um, uh, but this, you know, I mean, the roving reference, the, having people around uh, different places do it with different things, with, you know, wireless devices and PDAs or tablet PCs or um, uh, wireless voice devices. There's a variety. Or just, you know, hey, what's going on? That kind of stuff. I I think there's power in that because we've known forever that you know people are wandering the stacks asking student shelvers reference questions because they're there. And to be honest, most people who walk into a library think thinks everybody who works there's a librarian anyway. So why not have the librarians roaming around helping people? Beats staring at the reference desk, staring at each other. Been <laughs> done that for a while. Sorry, didn't mean to. Um, the evaluation notion, I hear a lot more talk about evaluation these days. Um, Self-evaluation, uh, especially with people using transcripts and email, um, uh, transcripts of chat sessions or instant messaging sessions or email things. Uh, evaluation is part of a training thing. Evaluation on a sort of continuing basis within a, um, a reference department, within an organization, et cetera. Um, I think the integration component is very important, and this excuse me, one service, many faces idea. Um, that it's just another one of those, if you turn it around, it looks easier. What a lot of libraries did when they implemented digital reference stuff was they implemented an email service. And they implemented a chat service. And, you know, and then there was the phone service, and that went on, and the face-to-face -face service, and that went on. And somehow it was all kind of disconnected. You know? And it was the email service, and the chat service, and the this, and the that, and the whatever. No, it's the service that you have lots of ways into, but once it gets in, internally it can get routed and sloshed around any way. So if somebody emails a reference question into you, and you know, it makes much more sense for them to come in, you say that. And on a website you say, here are the four different ways you can get at our service, and here's what you can expect. If you email us a question, you can expect an answer within 24 hours, and we can help you in this kind of way, and here's what we can, you can expect out of us. If you call us on the phone, you'll get an immediate answer or semi-immediate answer, but we may not be able to send you anything because you're on the phone. Uh, if, you, you know, if you come in, you might have to wait a few minutes. You have to come in, but we can offer you the highest level of service. And let people make up their mind. You know, give them all of these windows into your service, and then let them pick. Let them decide what kind of service is best for them. And then if you think it needs to be repurposed, repurpose it. Oh, you know, that's a really great question. Can I email you the answer tomorrow? Or I'm going to need a half an hour to work on this. Give me your email address or your fax number and I'll get it to you. That kind of stuff. Is, I mean, then it's not stovepipes. Then it's not, you know, I work in the email service so I don't ever have to look anybody again. Although there are librarians who are better at email reference because they don't have to deal with people. No names. I'm not looking at anybody, but I, I worked with at least one incredibly rude person in person who was just mean and snippy and unhappy and acted out with patrons in all kinds of ways. Basically, if you know, 
if you can't find the answer to this question, why should I help you? Which you got to love that in a reference librarian. <laughs> <sighs> and it was embarrassing. I mean, I'd be standing next to this person, and it's like, excuse me, why are you evil? What is your problem? A whole new world opened up when she started doing email. She blossomed. She loved it. She didn't have to talk to people. <gasps> but she could do reference. She could do reference on her own terms. It takes as long as you want, as long as 24 hours, blah, blah, blah. Tech. Beautiful stuff. The pros that flowed. Oh, my God. And everybody else was happier because she wasn't evil anymore, you know? Some people, some people. Um, what underli Here's the continuo back again. What underlies all of this is a different notion of what it is to be a library. Because this building, glorious as it is, and it's a beautiful building, by the way, love the, the decorative work in the front um, is not the library. This is a place where lots of stuff goes on. But this building is not the library. The concept of the library is any time, anywhere, any way in which people interact with the stuff you organize and pay for and help them to use. That interaction is the library. And it doesn't matter where it happens. In this building, in other buildings on this campus, in Eugene Public, in Corvallis, in Seattle, it does not matter. Me getting on your website this weekend from my house. I was in your library. It doesn't matter. So we have to begin by recognizing that the concept of the library has always been bigger than the building. But when you got physical objects that hold information, you got to have somewhere to put them. But when the stuff isn't necessarily tangible, it can go anywhere. So the building itself, is a repository for this kind of stuff, but it's not a repository for the concept. The concept of the library is and always has been much bigger. And we've always known that. Bookmobiles, interlibrary loan, outreach programs, telephone reference. We've known this for generations, that the concept of the library was working really hard to get out of the building. But it couldn't, really, because the stuff was here. Now, all of a sudden, finally, the promise of the library is extending where it always wanted to be. For thousands of years, the concept of the library has wanted to be free. And it finally is at this very important moment when the stakes are incredibly high and there's more competition for us than there ever has been. And um, we have to be ready to face that. So the concept of the library is way more important than this building. This building is very important. I always say libraries have to be somewhere and everywhere. So you've got to have a physical place. You've got to have this building. But you've got to be everywhere. You've got to be everywhere your community is. Because that's when they will want, that's where they can use you. The question is, do we want to? The question is, can we afford not to be everywhere and do everything? This involves trade-offs and reallocation. As I say, giving stuff up, which is going to be really hard, but probably necessary. Um, what people really need is us, you primarily. They don't need me because what do I do? But they need you and what you represent because we are the most important profession in the world. Why do people laugh when I say that? We're so used to thinking well of, we're so unused to thinking well of ourselves, it's appalling. Um, we are the most important profession because without us, the other professions aren't as good. We are the profession that makes humanity more human. We are the profession that takes the human record and organizes it and preserves it and helps people to find it for the next go around so that the next go around can be better. And as a result, the work we do is incredibly important. Uh, what we do is allow ourselves individually and collectively to be better. And the only way we can do that is if we are central to the information lives of our community. If, if they think of us as the place to go to do whatever it is they need to do, to create, to learn, to find, to be, to be better. If they think of us, and if we are there when they think of us, wherever and whenever they are, then we can do our job, which is to make them better. And that's the most important thing you can do with your life. 
And that's what we're going to do. Thank you very much. There's a little time for questions now that I've had my drink of water. I lasted longer than I thought. Yeah? So what do we give up? <laughs> uh, well, as for an example, ready reference. I don't think give it up, but I can't, I can't fathom emphasizing that as a primary feature of reference work because it's a losing proposition. You know, from a purely mercenary, excuse me, mercenary perspective, which, you know, it's a mercenary world in a lot of ways. Um, it, it's just not, it, other people can do it better than we can, other entities can do it better than we can, and, people, and if that's what people think we do, they won't think of us doing anything else. Yeah. Oh, I, don't know. I mean, it's it, it, it's to me, it's emblematic of repurposing what what we do, because if you think of the canonical reference desk, first of all, there's a desk, so that's up for grabs. Do you have a desk? Uh, we won't have the desk argument, but you know, whatever. So, a reference zone, area, sector, whatever. Um, you think of that, and then very close at hand are the ready reference tools, which immediately says, this is what I do, just by its very presence. Which, I mean, you've got to have the dictionary and the World Almanac and the Britannica and whatever. But it sends a message that that's what we do. Um, and if it says reference, what little dim notion people have of the word reference is quick and facty, is not, you know, I go to a reference desk to find out you know, what the gross domestic product of Brazil is, I don't go to a reference desk to begin a research investigation into the history of Brazilian economic development. If the thing says research, if the thing says help, if the thing says confused, if the thing says, look at me, I'm over here, you know, if it says something else, at least that, you know, something potentially provocative and shocking to the normal person, you know, to get them out of thinking of it as a reference desk. Because, I mean, imagine the, the generations of freshmen who have come to this building and what dim notions they have they expect to find a reference desk. Probably something big and monumental with, you know, librarians, and we all know what that means, standing behind it waiting with glasses perched on the edge of their nose and a chain hanging behind their neck and sensible shoes like I'm wearing um, to, you know, tell them what the gross domestic product of Brazil is. Which, why do I need that when I can get it from Google? So, the, uh, you know, giving up ready reference per se, probably you're right, isn't a huge thing. But that's, that's enough. You know, <laughs> ripping that scab off is going to be hard enough. And letting, letting I mean, and it's going to take a while. And it's going to take a while for people to reorient their thinking about what we do because they have decades and decades of, th of stereotype and caricature of what we do. And a lot of what people think about librarianship is stereotype and caricature. I don't know, there's at least a couple students in the crowd. I mean, how, how many times have people said, you have to get a master's degree for that? I mean, they think we stamp books and shush people. Why do you need a master's degree for that? Well, because you've got to shush and write. <laughs> and it matters where you stamp the book. You don't even stamp books anymore, do you? Well, we got to, well, oh, see, we gave that up. We gave up stamping books, which I actually kind of miss because I love seeing the stamps on the back. Anyway, I'm a dork. I'm a geek. What can I say? But, you know, I mean, the, to some extent, this is a your mileage may vary kind of situation, is that it really depends on the institution. Where, and I would much rather see that conversation begin with where do we go? So what, you know, reach first and then decide how much you have to give up. And it may be that it's less than you think, or stuff that nobody liked doing anyway. You know, like, why have we been doing this? Oh, well, I did it because someone so did it when I got here. But I've been doing it for 40 years, and I didn't really know why. I mean, all organizations are like that. That's, just, that's not just libraries, but you know, it's got to start somewhere. And, and to be honest with you, saying that to reference librarians freaks them out enough that it kind of gets the wheels turning. You know, it's not to I, I've been caricatured as saying we shouldn't do ready reference anymore. That's not what I'm saying. But go try to nuance things. You know, saying we should focus on other things and ready reference is fine in its place, that's scary enough let alone, you know, let's get rid of the desk or 
let's put, uh, you know, let's put reference library staff in the departments. You know, have an office space in the department, or let's, you know, work with the Office of Research, um, sponsored research, or whatever your equivalent is here to, you know, give them staff support to help faculty develop proposals by supplementing the research process. There's faculty who'd love that, by the way. Not just geeky faculty like me either. Other questions? Yeah. I haven't done it for a while, but I used to do it all the time. Yeah. Mazel tov. You know, congratulations. Tell the rest of us how you're doing it. Because um, there's a lot of reference librarians staring into space. Or, you know, trying really hard not to read the newspaper because you were told you're not supposed to read the newspaper because then you look mean and they won't come to you. Uh, or trying really hard not to look at your choice cards as you're, you know, doing your collection development. Um, <clears throat> what do we do better than anybody else does? We know how to search better. And we know how to search multiple ways. Um, I bet most of you who are experienced reference librarians, when somebody comes to you with a question, even before it's out of their mouths co totally, you've got four ideas about where to go. Maybe that's Google, maybe that's a database, maybe that's an encyclopedia, da 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 da, da. So we can't stop it. It's just what we do. How to search, searching in multiple ways, using the very sophisticated features of search tools, print and, and digital. Um, when to stop the search. Um, one of the key features that is something we do that nobody else does is helping people to figure out what it really is they want to know. The good old reference interview is, is our secret weapon. Not much of a secret, but a pretty formidable weapon because people just don't know. Please describe the whole. You, 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 reference, the reference interview is asking people to describe a whole. Tell me exactly what it is you don't know. That's very hard for people. Not to mention, they don't want to look stupid. So they're, you know, they're with you and they're trying really hard not to look like, look like an idiot, especially in a building like this, because if you don't know what you're doing in a building like this, you must be stupid. No, you're just ignorant. Stupid is forever. Ignorance can be cured. Put that on the front of your reference desk. See what happens for a week or two. <laughs> stupid is forever, but we cure ignorance. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> If that works, if that works, that was my idea. If it doesn't work, I never heard of it, despite the videotape. And I'm going to want that back when I get done. Um, uh, the, the, you know, helping people to understand what it is they really want to know, framing their need, understanding their need, articulating their need in some cases. Um, those kinds of things, I think, are where what we and and going deep, you know, really helping to be comprehensive. Um, because, you know, Google will get you an answer, but it rarely gets you a multiplicity of answers, or it rarely gives you the background. Google is really good for the specific, but the generic, or the general, or the comprehensive is very difficult. So if you type, you know, White House into Google Images, you'll get a picture of the White House. If you type architecture into Google, just native Google, you get like 10 different things on the front page, none of which is a history of architecture or a survey of architecture. You get information architecture, you get, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. But you don't get the kind of, you know, you don't get the Britannica article on the history of architecture. You don't get the Encyclopedia of Architecture. You don't get the, the American Institute of Architects. So that kind of depth and breadth, <coughs> I think, are among the things that set us apart. But this is a really, this is a, I mean, your question is very profound, is what, I mean, it's, and it's a challenge to us as a profession. What do we do better than anybody else does? And very few professions have to face that. Very few professions have to face that. And when they do face it, they often don't face it terribly well. Think of the travel agents. I mean, they, they, they thought of themselves as a profession that had a very specific need and there are a lot fewer travel agents than there used to be. And people only go to them when they're doing very sophisticated travel 
because you just book it online. You know, Orbitz and Expedia and Travelocity have killed, have eviscerated the travel industry, the travel agency industry. But, you know, the accountants are going along just famously, even in a world of TurboTax and Microsoft money and so on, because they provide depth and guidance and advice. And they keep you out of jail. <laughs> or they, they're supposed to, anyway. We'll find out when I get home. Um, anything else? Or what else? I shouldn't say it that way. What else? Questions? Mm -hmm. And first of all, they all said that they adore books. They do a huge amount of reading, and they hate reading on screens. But they also use Google and Wikipedia constantly. And so there was like the book and the internet. I said exactly what do you mean by the internet? And they said, you know, Google and Wikipedia and all the free stuff. Yeah. I said, what about library catalogs? They said that's not the internet. No. And they said they use them, but catalogs are complete not. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> Well, I mean, first question is, should we? I mean, do we want them to think of the library catalog as the internet? Um, in a way, that's a kind of subtle distinction, and they're kind of right. Yeah. I mean, you know, so I'm not sure I want to mess with that if they're right. I'd almost feel worse if they didn't. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm less interested in whether they think of the library catalog as the internet than that they're thinking of the library catalog at all, and that they see that as a viable way um, to get an information they satisfy. Uh, this, is, this is highly anecdotal, but I've heard this from like three people, so it must be true. This is science, you know. Um, that I, uh, people I have talked to who work with young people, and I think primarily high school, college age people, is that they are finding a sort of backlash against Google. That, you know, Google and what it, rep it represents is kind of what they want you to know it's kind of corporate and, you know, and so if you really want to know the true stuff, you know, you go to magazines and you go to books and so, and that's what a library is for. Now, I don't know where that's coming from, but yippee. I mean, we should ride that horse until it drops in its tracks because that's the best thing I ever heard. I don't have no idea where that comes from, but who cares? You know, I'm, I'm not interested in dissecting that so much as jumping on top of it because that's the greatest thing I ever heard. So if there's some, you know, if that phenomenon or something like it is going on, and there's the whole, you know, Google is evil, blah, blah, they're all watching us in our beds kind of thing going on, which, who knows? <laughs> I don't know where they are, but these big, you know, flying saucers are hiding in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> I always feel a little creepy when I walk into one of the Google 5 libraries. You know, it's like, where are they? Where are they scanning? You know, it's got to be in here somewhere. I used to teach at Michigan, so I know all the nooks and crannies of the graduate library at Michigan. I'm trying to figure out where the hell they are. Anyway, um, that, the, the, you know, I, I go back to this notion of centrality. I don't necessarily want to be first all the time when they think of something, but um, I read a research study years and years ago that haunts me to this very day. A couple of researchers in Ontario, uh, Canada, did a research study on... Uh, information sources for battered women. This was out of the University of Western Ontario, Roma Harris, and I think Pat Dudney did it. And so they interviewed women. They went door to door. This is a study I could not do. Went door to door and they interviewed women in their homes in Ontario and they said, if you had a friend who was being abused in her relationship, what sources of information, I mean, they used normal language, but what sources of information would you go, would you direct her to? And, the, you know, the women's shelter, the police, you can imagine the kind of, the, the library came 12th after the Salvation Army. Then they went to those places that people named, and they saw what kind of information resources did they have, and the library was second after the women's shelter. So the, most imp the second most important information resource was almost never used, almost never cited. Now, I mean, that's a very specific thing in a specific community for a specific subject area, et cetera. I get that. It's also very emotional and everything else. But 12th, 12th, under the radio. I mean, we b radio beat us, for crying out loud. <laughs> And the Salvation Army. I mean, I love, well, what's, I mean, I give the Salvation Army five bucks at Christmas like everybody does. But, I mean, the Salvation Army. So, I mean, that, and that was 15 years ago. So there's a lot of work to be done. 
But this notion of centrality, not center, but centrality, of just being there in people's minds when something comes up and then being in a position to help them when it does. And that's different for every library and every community. And especially in an organization, in a community as complicated as UO, for example, you have lots of communities. You have undergraduates, you have staff, you have alumni, you have faculty, you have graduate students, you have, you know, all different kinds, you have the institution, you know, if the president ever calls and wants something, you know, the president gets what the president wants. Um, but, you know, the, the, being central, being, the, the idea of being central in their information lives, I think, is really important. Anything? One more? Yeah, sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Other than shuddering, I, I, I congratulate you for being willing to go into the Facebook MySpace world. Ooh, a dark and scary place. Oh. Um, well, you know, go with God is all I can say. Um, that's a, you, you know, we've seen so many formats if, arise. You know, I think of blogs, I think of podcasts, I think of these phenomena, that it's hard to know when to jump. Actually, this is my April column <laughs> uh, in American libraries. But, I mean, that's 750 words. What are you going to do? And, and differently focused, but, you know, pulling the trigger on something like that is looking at, a, looking at a phenomenon like podcasting, like MySpace, like Facebook, which is a huge deal on college campuses. Um, and making the decision that that's actually worth it for us is a very hard decision to make because once we go somewhere, it's really hard for us to pull out. You know, think of a format we have abandoned once we actually meant it precisely. Um, I, I think the only format we really managed to escape is eight tracks because <laughs> we never jumped on it. But, I mean, we got microfilm. We have clay tablets, you know, back to the dawn of time. We, have, we fetishize Gutenberg leaves, you know. I mean, this is not a profession that is nimble in terms of picking and choosing its formats and it bases, you know, like, ooh, I don't know, do you think we can give up the vellum yet? Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Um, uh, it, I, I think we, but these things are going to come faster and faster and... and more and more of them all the time. And I think we just need to get, A, we need to be, have good criteria for deciding when and, and how much we would do. So having a presence in that kind of world, what would that presence look like? What would it achieve institutionally? I mean, is, that, is, there, is there a role for our professional domain in there? If so, what does it look like? How do we market that? How do we do it? And then have an exit strategy. Pardon the military terminology. But then if it doesn't work, or if it, you know, if the format dies, you know, if you're st if you're staffing some MySpace presence, at what point is that no longer worth it? And when do you stop? And when do you give yourself permission to stop? When do we give ourselves permission to stop using microfilm or newspapers or you know any other format you want to think about, um, or or genre or anything else? You know. Uh, uh, Public libraries have got to face this with cassette audiobooks. You know, at a certain point, that tips over and it's, DV, it's CDs or downloadable stuff. But, you know, how many cassette tapes are flying around out there? And when do you have the fire sale? You know, what's the fire sale for MySpace or Facebook? It, it's, so I don't have an answer. I have a procedure. I have a process, which is, or suggestions about process, which is what's it for? How do you measure whether it's doing what you think it's going to be doing to begin with? And how do you get out if it isn't working? You know, give it a chance because it's a cool idea, unless it isn't, in which case it's a terrible idea. And so stop it. So yay, boo, you know. <laughs> it's, it, but, you know but, but the question, I, the, the best part of the question is the question, is that you're thinking about it. Because, I mean, that's a real recognition that that's where people are. And I think one of the most important things you can do is to be where they are which is one of those kind of Zen koan sort of things. But, you know, be where they are, and then they'll come to you. But you can't, you know, you, you can't be central if you ain't there. Oh, the library. You're dead.
you know, if it's this, uh, if it's, you know, if it, I mean, you are geographically proximate. You are, you know, you're here. And this building can go anywhere. But you need to be, you know, wherever they are, you got to be there. So first you've got to figure out where they are and what the hell they're doing. Although you probably don't want to know what they're doing in my, in my space in particular. You just, you just, you know, just wear rubber gloves or something. I don't know. Okay. I think I'm done. I'm done. Thank you all very much. <laughs>